This word has gone through multiple euphemisms over the years. Personally, as a kid growing up in the early 2000s, I remember when indie meant flash game. In the late 2000s, it meant Xbox Live Arcade game. But above all, indie prior to the 2010s meant retro. Side-scrollers, beat-em-ups, puzzlers, tower defense, shmups, dungeon crawlers, and top-down shooters. Games associated with the past. Even those that weren't employing a retro aesthetic were still echoing the core gameplay of their inspirations. And this is a really good thing. Being able to iterate on designs almost completely abandoned after the 90s led to some of the greatest games ever made. But it was sometimes hard to sell people on a game whose core formula dated back to the 90s. However, there were always innovative indie games brewing underground in the 2000s. And upon the next decade, they didn't surface to the mainstream. They exploded. And one of the biggest contributors was Hotline Miami. Those who previously ignored Castle Crashers or Super Meat Boy took notice of this bloodbath almost immediately because underneath all the nostalgia its setting, visuals, music, and pixel art provokes laid a style of game that was remarkably innovative. Spawned from a decade-old prototype, Denaton Studios created something with no reference to the games that previously defined top-down shooters. Smash TV didn't have players strategically kicking doors to knock down enemies to the floor and slam their faces. You weren't circling with an endless magazine, but calculating when and where to attack with just one. And you weren't an ounce stronger than the enemies you faced. It was a revolution. This game might have been technically possible since the 90s, but the top-down shooter being eclipsed by the first-person shooter in the 90s left a gap in the market unfilled for 20 years. This genre is as foundational as gaming's founders, and yet today, when anything top-down is witnessed, even when it's inspired by something else, the average gamer's reference is, this is Hotline, Hotline Miami. Miami. That was the impact this game had. It redefined not just the subgenre of top-down shooters, but changed the indie game itself. It's genuinely incredible. And yet, for as much as I loved Hotline Miami, what I couldn't wait for was the Castle Crashers or Super Meat Boy equivalent for it. The iterative, perfected version of this style of game. And just over 10 years after it released, I was still waiting. There's a vast array of top-down games on the market, but they don't scratch that itch. Each is a fundamentally different style of game in everything from sound design to visuals and even movement. Hotline Miami's fast-paced combat, high-energy soundtrack, and brutal pixelated violence is something that can only be satisfied by playing Hotline Miami. And the problem with that is Hotline Miami's gameplay Enemies don't notice when their own allies drop dead. There's no indicator for what item you're going to pick up or when you're going to take down an enemy. Movement's floaty, aiming stiff, the zoom keys as necessary is breathing. Your bullets are a lie. And doors are a slot machine whenever more than one enemy dares to pass through. There's not even a sensitivity slider. You had to adjust the window's cursor settings. It's not jank. Stalker is jank, and because of how expansive it aims to be. The better word for Hotline Miami, I think, is what a friend used to describe it. I made a prototype of a top-down shooter in Unity. I was like, oh, how should I implement this? Let me look at Hotline Miami. And I realized I had developed more advanced mechanics after like two weeks of development than they had in their finished game. Yeah. Like for camera control, for shooting, for like recoil, and for all of that. Like, Hotline Miami is so primitive. I want to make a Hotline Miami game where the quality of the gameplay has a kind of flow that's like max pain or fear levels of kind of quality, that kind of smoothness and elegance. And that was my disappointment. Hotline Miami's sequel, Wrong Number, resolved virtually none of these things. Except the sensitivity slider. But the controls, enemy behavior, door behavior, and uninformative interface weren't just ignored, they were exacerbated by the game's infamous level design. 
packing off-screen shotgunners like it was helping your rapidly declining sanity. Meanwhile, Hong Kong Massacre went 3D, Garage Bad Trips more survival horror, and Kusan City Wolves, while I enjoyed the demo, isn't out yet. And it's why after that conversation, I was still yearning for a game that could scratch that itch. Until I found Ocho. This indie top-down roguelike shooter is the latest solo project by Lateralis Heavy Industries. Or just Nate. I've never played any of his games and honestly didn't think much of this one upon seeing its Steam page. Not because of its art style, price tag, or influences, merely this part of the description. Like survival and real-time strategy games, I've played many roguelikes of quality and many that have compelled, but never enough to see the credits. Depending on the game, that's not exactly rare, but despite recognizing and admiring the excellent gameplay of Nuclear Throne, Dead Cells, and especially Synthetic, they just don't stir my soul enough to put up with the repetition this genre necessitates. And Ocho has all of the genre's tropes. RNG, annoying boss fights, difficulty spikes, and the aforementioned repetition. All the while suffering from the same game maker limitations regarding mouse control as Hotline Miami. Even the opening tutorial is rather unflattering, with its total silence and writing so dry it should come with a hydration warning. Yet despite all of this, for the first time in a roguelike, I saw the credits. And I will happily illustrate why. Hotline Miami is intense, with its high body count, fast speed, and synth-based soundtrack. But Ocho's body count is even higher, the speed is even faster, and the synth is even more based. And that intensity starts with guns. These aren't devastating compared to other indie games, but to almost anything you can throw at it. I've whinged about puny pew pew effects in video games for years, and while it's become less prevalent in AAA, after billions of bullets, it's very hard for a game to elicit any emotion out of me from firing a gun. And what I didn't expect to change that was a top-down game maker solo project. Ocho includes a vast arsenal for players to unlock, made by somebody who's probably played every notable shooter in the last 15 years with its range of iconic staples. And each of them, if not flat out the best version of that gun in a video game, is at least in the top five. What's remarkable is, unlike Medal of Honor, it doesn't cheat. Pistols are pistols. Shotguns are shotguns. And LMGs are ridiculous. Just the weapons are almost enough to fill the entire soundscape during combat and the little that's left is stuffed by a soundtrack from the developer himself that pushes the intense into the insane. dark, abrasive, and high-strung, but not without an infectious, hummable melody. One's powerful enough to push me into charging when I should be cautious. Honestly, just these two pillars alone would be enough to keep me entertained for a couple hours. Half the enjoyment of many iconic shooters is down to weapons and music, but the other half is a near-perfected gameplay loop. Hotline Miami unquestionably had the former, but it was never afforded the latter. Ocho has the former, and it makes many, many changes in pursuit of the latter. So many that, in truth, the biggest similarity Ocho has to Hotline Miami is its highest viewed YouTube video being the soundtrack. Feeling like a game and playing like a game 
are very different. Counter-Strike feels like Half-Life, because it is, but it doesn't play like it. Ocho shares an engine. It's fast-paced and violent with a blood-pumping soundtrack and surreal atmosphere. But in gameplay, everything has evolved. Your avatar doesn't drift, stick, or slide, but they're also not so weightless to feel disconnected from the world. It's a perfect balance between the two extremes of game feel, freeing players to devote their full attention to the fights they're in, rather than fighting the game itself. And that confidence is felt through both hands. This is the closest I've ever felt to Game Maker being an extension of my hand. And that's not just down to its technical precision, but design. One of the simplest but biggest changes from Hotline Miami is removing the look ahead key, while still natively being able to look beyond the character's immediate surroundings paired to a widened FOV. Just this tweet kills three birds with one stone. Distant enemies are easier to fight, there's no jarring perspective shift, and the lock-on doesn't need to exist. And because range fights are now more viable and dynamic, you're able to experience how each weapon in the arsenal stands out. Long-range accuracy and damage drop-off matters here. You can't just use a shotgun as a quad-barrel sniper rifle. Though that is largely due to you and your enemies having health. Instant death is a core part of what makes many games intense, yet it sometimes had the opposite effect in Hotline Miami. Those off-screen shotgunners are so infuriating because you instantly die. It also stresses the low visibility, stiff controls, weapon pickups, questionable AI, and creates scenarios with, ironically, no tension. A steel pipe thug against your locked-on firearm isn't a threat. And the proposed solutions from Hotline Miami's inspirations are no less primitive. Hong Kong Massacre just arms everyone, and predictably, the core gameplay is fun, but one note, because there's no dynamics, no flow, no variation. The knob is just duct tape to 11, and there is an appeal in that. I did finish Hong Kong Massacre. But there's several ways to make a top-down action game exciting. And Ocho dispels the myth that one-shot deaths are a requirement to make one. Giving everybody health allows you to go from confident to fearful in the same encounter. Weapons are dependent on where they're used on top of how they're used. The threat of each enemy type varies per fight, as well as the weapons they fire. In Hotline Miami, I never cared which gun an enemy has, just that they have one. Whereas I very much care in Ocho if the final foe I'm against on low health is using the well rod or a double barrel. On paper, this slows the game down, and it would in practice if the player wasn't made more powerful. But you are. At all times, you're able to vault, kick, reload, roll, and slow down time. Two of those may not sound like much, and the first I admittedly sometimes forget, but kicking and reloading are in fact just as important as rolling underneath bullets while slowing them down. Just like how grenades went from separate weapons to a single trigger pull, Ocho's kick isn't separated from the arsenal. You don't need to toss aside weapons to give the boot, even with an M60. The kick isn't just always viable, but the best option for disposing a single enemy at point-blank range being an instant kill. And because it's a kick, your hands are free to reload during the kill. Now I've said that not every game benefits from reloading, but Ocho does. It adds tension when baddies are charging down the hallway, strategy via its magazine permanence, but most importantly, it just flows so much better than having to toss aside weapons to keep shooting. And when that does happen, the UI outlines the next weapon you're going to grab. Thank God. What you obviously can't do while reloading is roll, but you won't care when avoiding damage is a lot more important than dishing it out. Functionally, the roll's implemented beautifully. It doesn't at all feel like wrong number. And the pixel art's readability makes it much easier to keep track of when you're dodging than Hong Kong Massacre. And because you can't fire while dodging like in Hong Kong Massacre, it's a choice rather than a reflex. And it's a brilliant choice to give players, as even when an enemy's on target, you can dodge it. So every hit is a reminder that it's ultimately on you, the player. And that guilt goes double for bullet time. 
There are penalties during its use, the FOV is lowered, it's on a properly limited charge, and like the original Max Payne, your own bullets are considerably slowed, and in the right circumstances, to the point of outrunning them. And it's exactly what stops this mechanic from being as broken as, say, Max Payne's sequel. Traditionally, bullet time is for room clearing. Bursting through the entrance, clipping everybody one by one with a perfect shot to the skull. And that's not to say you can't do that here, but as Ocho tightens hallways, extends sight lines, and packs way more enemies, using bullet time only for aggression just isn't feasible forcing players to use it only with purpose, especially because enemies do not fuck around. They've been designed with all of the player's core abilities in mind and are given different or additional traits with each floor of the mansion you ascend. The safety period most action games have to give players a window to react doesn't exist here. Enemies see you, they shoot you, with alpha protocol reaction times. Honestly, it really pissed me off back when I first played this game's demo because I couldn't get past these assholes, mainly because they didn't do what I expected. If there's anything that video games have taught me, it's that thick boys with backpacks are going to fire their area of effect once every couple of seconds. Not every second. And when there's two of them, the mansion becomes Mortal Kombat's Deadpool. But I came to realize that despite this game's cutthroat challenge, you've got everything needed to fight every enemy in this game, even without bullet time, though it's a necessity for 90% of us. The Alpha Protocol reactions occur when attacking enemies in their direct line of sight, and there's several ways to combat this. Bullet time's one of them, but there's also flanking, destroying the door from a distance behind cover, waiting till they're close enough to said door to splatter them, using grenades, or utilizing your bonuses. This is where the game can turn you into a giggling psychopath. There's been plenty of amazing abilities in games, but Ocho's specialty is how many of the over 100 are bad ass. There's cowboy ghosts assisting in bullet time, explosive barrels in every room, granting the player a recharging shield and bubble shield. There's homing bullets, bigger bullets, faster bullets, or the best of all, thrown guns transforming into automatic turrets. Eat your heart out, perfect dark. Best of all, these drinks have no restrictions. All previously mentioned can be stacked together. And this is why even the drinks which aren't as sexy, like moving faster with a pistol or extending combos, over the course of a run can be absolutely diabolical. Take for instance, Heavy. This drink ups the damage on every weapon by 20%, but it also slows bullet velocity, which isn't bad if you don't stack it with Black Market like I did. This was rough, especially during the Colossal Chapel featuring some of the game's longest sight lines. This was how I could run past my own bullets. But then I got Prestissimo, that increases fire rate, and Dividends, which increases it by 15%, and Reserve giving every gun an extra magazine, and I felt like a fucking supervillain. After nearly two decades of perks, skill trees, modifiers, boosters, attachments, proficiencies, it's so refreshing to play a game where these bonuses aren't useful, but vicious. It's hilarious to have a killer dog, armed drone, and cowboy spirit together, as is blowing up every squad with explosive barrels, blowing up every squad with upgraded shotguns, or erasing them via double damage do wield MP40s with even more damage in bullet time. I've never laughed this maniacally at a game in my life. But what makes Ocho's gameplay transcendent is this intoxicating power is on a knife's edge. It is not press Q to win. It is not berserk, it is earned. The insane reaction times of your enemies, combined with their vast numbers and unique traits, even with all of these drinks, the game is still capable of kicking your ass. It only takes a handful of mistakes to put you back on the beach. And at least in my experience, a lot of those mistakes come from how you approach doors. It's not just Hotline Miami that struggles. 
Doors seem to be a deceptive challenge in game development at all levels, from syncing animations and sightlines in multiplayer to AI behavior in single player. And it makes sense, because most functions in video games are binary. Firing, not firing. Spotted, searching, climbing, falling. By contrast, extremely detailed measurements like bullet trajectory, tire surfaces, or a door are immensely more time consuming in isolation, let alone when they're reacting to dozens of other mechanics that can have huge ramifications, like not knowing when an enemy will see you through a gap. There's a reason Rainbow Six Siege doesn't have any, and Ocho's solution is just one step more complex. Doors can only be opened by you. And they're only open via damage, be it explosives, guns, or most commonly, the foot. Of all the design choices that Ocho makes, this may in fact be the absolute wisest. By giving doors just two states, instead of millimeters confusing both players and the AI what qualifies as open or shut, it gives a constant in every battle that every player can easily understand no matter how many bullets are in the air. Enemies will come through here, not here, unless I decide to change that. And you sometimes should. But for every door open, you've alerted and allowed whoever's on the other end of it to use that pathway too, which can come to bite you back later, or right away, depending on the severity of your mistake. This is why the drink cliche, for as devastating as it can be, is a double-edged sword when it opens doors withholding forces that can easily overwhelm you. These things are also linked to the health and reload mechanics. Doors are sometimes best opened with weapons, but that decision will cost you a decent chunk of ammo, with the exception of shotguns, which is something else to consider. But whether the advantage of firing before the enemy sees you is worth that cost will vary on a case-by-case -case basis and player-to-player. -player. By simplifying this mechanic, it allows even the most minute to shine. And all of this is what can be accomplished iterating an established formula once. I've played founder-led spiritual successors, quarter-billion-dollar sequels, and two-decade franchises with less evolved gameplay than Ocho. None of the individual design choices are radical, and that's kind of the beauty of it. This game isn't unique from one mechanic, but every mechanic supporting another. Even the vault I forget exists. Not only do the handcrafted rooms incorporate it from movement options that don't normally exist in these games, there's drinks to enhance its power, altering your playstyle. It's when everything comes together like this that you get a completely different experience than what came before. Hotline Miami with drinks would be just that, but because of its optimized controls, tougher and smarter enemies, overhaul damage, player base traits, and bonus traits with better doors, it's not Hotline Miami anymore. It's Ocho, and what cements this is the structure. Many of my favorite games are narrative-based. This doesn't necessarily mean telltale adventure games or walking sims, just a linear campaign that connects its series of levels through a series of events, and they're great. But gameplay is inherently confined. You quite literally have no control at specific junctions during the campaign. Sometimes they're necessary, sometimes they're obnoxious. But in both cases, there's been times I've wanted the gameplay in a game that's not confined. Wait a minute. An American military operation against the USSR invading Hawaii? With Moon making me feel like I'm creeping around this very jungle? Oh, hell yeah! It's over. I didn't want it to be over. I'm not saying effect and cause should last forever in Titanfall 2's campaign, but I've wanted a game that forever is effect and cause, or Max Payne 3, or Hotline Miami. And now for one of those wants, I'm completely spoiled. Ocho's confidence isn't worn on its sleeve, but woven into its flesh. 
Never does this game fruitlessly bog itself down with swimming levels, mini games, vehicle sections, turret segments, stealth missions, story sequences, or any other video game cliches that would only fail to convince anybody of what we're really here for. Ocho's structure is remarkably simple. Bar, three fights, bar, two fights, boss, repeat. So the thread in every run is coin. The more coin you earn, the more drinks you can buy, and the more powerful you become against enemies that drop coin. And the higher your combo meter is when killing them, the more coin they drop. In many ways, it's the final puzzle piece for Ocho's core gameplay. You're not just being aggressive because of the awesome music or to earn a high score. It's genuinely the best strategy. A player that's too cautious in every level won't be making enough coin to buy the drinks they need and are likely to fall under the weight of the mansion's later floors. Each floor adds a new trait to all enemies and a new unique enemy, placed in a new setting with its own visual style and level layout. The untold bathhouse obscures your vision and heads-up display. The primordial conservatory adds windows to see and be seen through. The boundless hallways are exactly what they sound like, and the Cosmic Ballroom combines everything you've learned over the course of the game with rocket launchers set to the fringes of space. It's awesome. And a barometer for whether or not Ocho is a game that you'll enjoy. This game is not Half-Life 2. It's not Titanfall 2. It's not about doing lots of different things in lots of different places to make it feel like you've been on a journey. This is much more like Doom or Fear. It's about one thing and one thing only. Several of my friends want their games to have more than one thing, and I wouldn't recommend Ocho to them. Me? I'm still playing the original Doom. So the pure, bare-bones, no-nonsense, over-the-top action game that Ocho is, it's honestly refreshing to play a new video game where the shoe is on the other foot. After countless occasions of playing a game with an amazing core that's needlessly obfuscated beneath swimming levels, minigames, vehicle segments, story sequences, etc., I might prefer just having the core. I'd love Ocho's gameplay loop in the context of a traditional narrative-based campaign. It'd be wonderful. It'd also be a different game. The simple joy of hopping in and immediately playing all the way to the end is something that in an action game these days, I've come to cherish. And it's not like Ocho is completely devoid of context. There's characters to meet, weapons to test, add and remove from the mansion, diary logs to read, chambers to explore, dogs to play fetch, and fish to catch. But these are all done at the player's will. If you're on run 12 and not in the mood to care about these creepy stills so you can get to the next boss fight, walk past them. They're only there if you want them. The opening tutorial and first boss fight are the most tedious this game gets, and even then, the tutorial's only done once, and Glass Joe can be killed in less than a minute, allowing me to dive right back into an almost perfected gameplay loop that even after collecting every perk, weapon, and collectible, I need more. My wish list for this game isn't cutscenes, stealth, or vehicles, but more songs more customization, more levels, more guns, and more drinks. Two of which have already happened with all new modifiers that change up the gameplay. Running through the entire mansion with just kunais and grenades is shockingly fun. Explosives in boss fights are less fun. Now my words against these annoying boss fights are a lot less harsh since beating the game multiple times. A lot of my initial frustration is another staple of the genre I'm not personally a fan of. You've probably been here. Room after room after room. Oh boy, a new area. Oh boy, a new boss. But now that I'm quite familiar with all of these fights, losing to an unfamiliar pattern or move isn't a problem. Any mistakes made in a boss fight now are on me. Like getting a speeding ticket. Only if this game were a cop, 10k would get me a ticket and 15k would get me the chair. See, the Devil's Wave attack has a one second wind up, and should you fail to dodge it, roughly 10% of health is lost. But the explosive attack, that's only one second longer to wind up, takes more than twice that. And that's before it gets multiplied. 
I know what my errors were here. I'm running towards rather than away. Bullet time's used for the windup, not the throw. And I'm directly in the attack's path. But these are all the same mistakes I made for an attack that's almost identical, except an outcome. Thankfully, there is something of a fix for this difficulty. An exploit that I pray the developer doesn't remove. Quitting. Continue game starts you from the beginning of whichever level you were previously on. So for bosses, you can fight until you're at critical health, quit to menu, continue, and have another go. But there's another quarrel this exploit doesn't fix. Here's me trying for way too long to defeat the devil with a full auto Glock. It's not going well, and the ending really wasn't worth it. Now some would say, Ray, you dumb fuck. And others would say, Ray, why would you bring a Glock to a boss fight? And that's fair. I got carried away by my new toy and brought it where I shouldn't have. So why can't I change it? Unless the game really means to suggest that choosing the wrong weapon for a fight you may not even be experienced with deserves starting all over again, bottom. I really, really hate to play armchair developer. But I can't stop myself from thinking the four random weapons players can pick before a boss fight should just be in the boss fight just to give someone a chance during those impossible fights that they can unknowingly cause. But at the end of the day, you know what I did after dying with that Glock? I started all over again, made the devil my bitch, reached the credits, and started all over again. The stim shot that is Ocho's gameplay is just intoxicating. When it comes to the core, I can count all of my nitpicks on one hand. Hotline Miami 2's infamy does rear its ugly head in the later stages, even with your crosshair at the very edges of the screen. The health system prevents these scenarios from being traumatic, and flanking enemies in larger levels is really fun. I just wish the stationary turrets had something to distinguish them beyond your screen. Because this adrenaline pumping game can get reduced to red light green light at times. Relating to enemies, while they can be an awesome challenge even in a one-on-one -on -one fight, they can also revert to suicide charges. Unrelated to enemies, gun boot sucks ass through a straw. And my favorite drink in the game is also currently the buggiest. Not that it'd save you from the handful of rooms in this game that are completely fucked and the most nitpicky of all. While I love the game's art style and think the environments do enough to distinguish each other, there was an instance this game's color palette got me killed. During a desperate fight in the library, I glanced at what seemed in that split second to be half a health bar, meaning I could survive a couple more It didn't record the microphone, but I was screaming. Only to see the blood on the floor just made it look that way in the moment. It's so hyper-specific this only happened to me once, but I think there should at least be the option for a number on the side. Oh, and no sense slider. So I guess that's more than one hand, but I don't care because I love this game and it deserves so much more love. Nothing has made me revel in such glee since Doom. And that game doesn't have supercharged laptop guns. From here on out, whenever I think of top-down shooters, this is the game that immediately comes to mind. But if there's room for Ocho, Super Meat Boy, or Castle Crashers, I'd love to see it. Really, I'd just love to see this type of iteration across the gaming landscape. Baldur's Gate 3 has seemingly done just that. So has Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, with potentially Soleco, El Paso Elsewhere, Resistor, and Unrecord. But I'm daydreaming of seeing this for Far Cry, Mirror's Edge, Tomb Raider, or Need for Speed. It's not only how modern classics get birthed, it proves what's always known but easy to forget during periods of stagnation and safe choices. There's always room to grow, refine, and perfect. One last thing. Nate, you fucking nailed it.
uploading a video. My task list in June involved packing for family visit in Manhattan, writing a 007 short film, writing a miniseries, co-writing a feature film, organizing shamble, writing four article, writing weekly Q&A, testing multiplayer games for Discord hang, designing a racetrack for a notable AC mod, buying eggs. Needless to say, juggling all of this and a YouTube channel that is how I make a living wasn't sustainable. It became very apparent that if I'm gonna work, more of my work needs to be aired to the public. To make that happen, I dropped four to five different video scripts that went nowhere, lowered my external workload considerably, got a Vivans prescription for ADHD that I've never treated, and went on my trip with a good chunk of this video primed to be edited after visiting family. Landing back in BC, I was ready to rock. For everyone who reached out, donated, or just kept watching my videos while I've been gone. Thank you. It genuinely allowed me to keep up with the rent where I otherwise wouldn't while I was out of commission. Both for incompetence and infection. Now, there's a lot of questions to catch up on. Where video? Right here. Why video? Good game. What video? Bomb rush. When video? Four years. Why are you Canadian? Mom left LA because of... Yeah. I won the lottery. Which game from 1998 aged better? Half-Life, Metal Gear Solid, or Ocarina of Time? Definitely Half-Life. Not only are the majority of shooter campaigns today still basically Half-Life, the game itself is the best just in terms of movement, shooting, pacing, and atmosphere. What should we name our child? You know the one. Test Drive 5, and welcome to a brand new segment, Race the Knee Victano. Why? I don't know what started this. My questions page on Discord was just filled with people asking about their playlists. This is the most capital G gamer playlist I've ever seen. I bet showing you an album would be like the end of Raiders. You're a teenager who after a diagnosis of something is already thinking about their 30s. There's a couple bangers in here, but anyone who puts cigarettes after sex in their get down playlist has the originality of missionary. And wait, what the fuck kind of sex are you having? Yeah, you like depressed goth chicks. I know what you are! Who is the best character in all of Mass Effect and why is it Garrus? I think one of the reasons Garrus is fascinating is that he's a renegade who you can turn paragon but only when you're around him. Whereas other characters firmly stand their ground, sometimes to the point of death, Garrus will adjust his entire worldview based on what Shepard tells him, despite his own thought process defaulting to quite extreme positions on justice, like vigilantism, execution, and disobeying protocol. Even though those exact things are applicable to Saren, who he claims to hate. And what's doubly fascinating is that he seems to know by Mass Effect 3 how much of a sponge he is. You can tell which things really eat at him depending on how he reacts to Shepard's choices. I know you had your reasons for choosing the Geth, Shepard, and I'll respect them. But Tally's choice, that'll be harder to get over. It's details like these that really make Mass Effect 3, despite its problems. The Marathon reboot is an extraction shooter. Why can't we have nice things? It's probably because Marathon fits in what's become a genre at this point of games that are known among everyone because of their influence on the industry, not because the average person has actually played them. You yourself, John, are only sad because of what Mandalore showed you, not because of what you personally experienced. What's the funniest fake mobile game ad on YouTube? Ironically, showing that would get me demonetized on YouTube. What's the most embarrassing video game opinion you used to subscribe to? I used to like Spunk Gargle Wee Wee. There's old reviews on my computer for games like Medal of Honor with scores so fucking high I'd never want to show them to anybody ever. Imperial or Metric? Please say Metric. Metric. But I've used miles an hour for too long to switch in driving games. That would probably change were I to get my driver's license due to the roads here in Canada. What is today's sponsor? This video is sponsored by Vivans. Seriously, I don't know why I didn't take it earlier. I probably would have quit YouTube this year without it. Which video game franchises have you filed for divorce with? 
Rainbow Six. Which song do you think is not used enough in fight scenes? Hey everybody, my name is Sparky from Sparky Games on YouTube, uh, uh, and I was thinking of a song that only gets used like one time ever in a fight scene, which is kind of fucked up if you think about it, right? I, I, I had to answer this for me because if Ray answered it, he'd probably say something like really obscure, some stupid band no one's ever heard of, like Green Day or something. But uh, I'm, I'm here with like a good song that definitely should be in more fight scenes. It's only ever been in one. Here, I'll play a bit for you. Hold up. So, I mean, like, it should be used more. Because it's a banger song. I like the part where it says, Blow me away!